Today's speaker is Vedi Hadari from Bikant University. Um, well, I forgot the title, but okay. Vedi, you can take over. Okay. So, uh, okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk about co-limits of categories, uh, zigzags, and necklaces. So, uh, so I'll be presenting on a paper with the same title that um, you can find in archives uh, that I wrote quite recently. So, uh, not refereed yet, but I'll try to convince you <laughs> that the results are valid. Uh, although some preliminary feedback seems positive. All right, I'm not. Anyway, so so uh, this is a natural continuation of the last talk given here in our higher category theory seminar, uh, which I gave, sort of, I guess, prompted this <laughs> kind of work. Okay, so so let us recall uh, some things from that talk, and then I will to motivate sort of what I'm going to talk about here. So. Uh, so recall uh, so given some n uh, in delta which means just a natural number basically bigger than zero so we have a construction which we presented uh, in that talk so this is a this is the simplicially enriched category uh, indexed by n. So let me recall just briefly what uh, what this looks like. Okay, so we have we have that so the objects are just. 0, 1 up to n. So uh, same as the category delta n. This is like a simplicially enriched version. So I will say home spaces are defined as follows. So I need to define we have n and if I pick two objects i and j this will now be a simplicial set. Okay. So this simplicial set can be described as follows. Okay. So this will be a simplicial set. So now fix some p in delta like a p simplex in this space. So a p simplex which we will denote uh, u with like a vector notation. Uh, so this is in here. So is, uh, so I'll use Dagger and Spivak's term, the flag of subsets of i dot 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 j right. of length p plus one so this is basically there is like a u zero u one up to up such that i and j are in u0 uh, which means they are in all of them all right so we discussed uh, uh, how 
So we discussed the following idea in the previous lecture, so I'm not going to go at length about it, but basically it means the following. So if C is a simplicial inverse category, uh, then uh, a morphism from this simplicial delta n to C uh, is a homotopy uh, coherent uh, and simplex of C. So this ties up with this very important uh, notion of homotopy coherence which is at the center of both, I guess, homotopy theory and higher category theory. Yeah, anyway, so, so, and we also discussed how uh, by Yoneda extension, so, so this, construction of the thick version of delta n. So these are simplicial inverse categories. So this will produce, uh, so this is the Yoneda embedding from delta to simplicial sets. So this will produce an adjoint pair. Uh, so called coherent nerve and what I will denote C for uh, categorification or simplicial categorification. So let me say what these. So so just like indicated here. So if I give you, so if if I have a simplicially enriched category, the coherent nerve. will have as n simplices uh, functors, simplicial functors from thick delta n to C. So this functor is pretty, pretty easy to describe. Uh, so, I mean, we have an explicit description of this thick delta n. And given some C, we know what these uh, n simplices will be. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, and this is, of course, important functor. So, uh, the problem is in describing this functor here. So, this functor C, let me mention, I'm going to think about it as a free simplicially enriched category functor. So given a simplicial set, we build this simplicial enriched category. So and there is a formula for this, so let me let me explain. So let let X be a Uh, no, th this is just a notation for so this cat with a triangle. So this means just simplicially enriched category. Yeah, S set cut. No, I mean, I mean, it's a free object in cut triangle. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so that, I mean, yeah, so the thing is that if we pick a simplicial set X, this C, technically we know how to uh, define it. So let, let me also review this part. So there is a category, so this is, by the way, standard 
Yoneda theory on categories. I mean, I'm not doing any uh, uh, any unknown science so far. So, so let me define the category of simplices. So. of x. So the objects are, well, simplices of x, which we know are represented by uh, simplicial set maps from the representables. So say x, for example, we could also write x in xn. So n ranges all over delta and the morphisms they are just commutative triangles. So, here. So, so a morphism from x to y would be like uh, this thing here. Yeah, anyway, so so uh, this is the Gert and deconstruction, etc. Our category of elements. There are many interpretations. The bottom line is that uh, we, we have a functor, so we have uh, a functor um, from the category of simplices to uh, simplicially enriched categories, which takes, I mean, it's sort of a forgetful functor. So, it will map an n simplex into just copy of delta n. So the thick delta n. And so uh, let's call this functor, well, I think I've called it chi, sort of characteristic functor. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so we have that the free simplicially enriched category can be computed as the limit of this function over the simplex category. So of course, uh, so we see that uh, understanding uh, this simplicially enriched category would involve understanding co-limit of this diagram, uh, which is a diagram of simplicially enriched categories. So uh, those are typically tough to understand. So what do I mean? So one thing we know about this is that the objects will be the zero simplices. Okay. So given, and if I'm given Two objects, I want to know what is the mapping space. So, what are the simplices of this simplicial set? And there is sort of, I mean, no way of deducing this from the uh, this diagram description. It's uh, it's difficult. There is no. Uh, call limit form. I mean, there is no way to go from here to here. So, I mean, saying what these spaces are explicitly would be an explicit description, but we cannot deduce it from the from the call limit, right? So, uh, so right. So we so this call limits of categories and the study of that is sort of motivated from this type of co-limit here. Uh, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the theorem of Dagger and Spivak, which uh, sort of gives us an answer for this question, like what are these mapping spaces, etc. cetera. So, uh, so let me just state uh, the theorem from Dagger and Spivak. So, so this question here, uh, 
The answer is Maclis theorem by Dagger and Spivak. So let me, I will briefly summarize and state uh, what this theorem says. Okay, so what is a necklace? So I've, I've read that the notion of necklace in topology was introduced by Baus. So, and it comes up in the, in the study of loop spaces, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, so a necklace, so this is sort of a definition. So a necklace, is a simplicial set of the form uh, delta n1 wedge 1 here, wedge delta n2 wedge delta nk. So what do I mean by wedging? I'll just say by example, so we have, say, a copy of delta 2, so this has a first and terminal vertex, and say, by wedging, I mean, with first vertex of this is concatenated with the last vertex of this, so for instance, What I just drew here would be uh, like delta 2 wedge delta 1. And this is a necklace. Okay. So, so this notion of necklace uh, is like this, pretty interesting. Okay, so maybe it should indicate this is a two simplex. Okay, so the terminology I will just uh, sort of mentioned here. So these final and terminal vertices, so these are called the joints or joints. Is there a T here? I think joints. Okay. Forgive my English. So joints of the necklace. So if, if I denote the necklace T, which is a simplicial set of this form, this set is denoted NT. Okay, and these individual, these individual constituents of the necklace, uh, they are called beads. So, you know, you have the necklace, it has some beads, and it has some joints. And the union of all these vert of all the vertices are called the vertices. So, beads, and let me just say, union of vertices uh, we just call the vertices of the necklace. Okay, so is there any Thing which is unclear, okay? So let me repeat, we have like a concatenate, like stringing together simplices, basically. That's, you call it a necklace, okay? So the points where you join the simplices with each other are called the joints, including the first and the last. And the vertices are called like every vertex in, which is included in every simplex. Okay, so, so, uh, this is another example would be taking just a delta n by itself. So one bead necklace with first and last vertex as the joints. Okay. 
Okay, so so typically, so let me write this write it as a note here. So typically, we consider a necklace as a bipointed simplicial set, meaning this first and last vertex are vertex marks. Okay, so it has like a, 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 a an initial vertex and a terminal vertex. Okay, so pretty clearly. Uh, we can make that consideration. Okay, so now I can state this theorem. And uh, so Dagger and Spivak So the theorem says the following. Okay. So uh, Okay, so let me restate. So let X be a simplicial set, uh, then, okay, let us, let me also fix, sorry, and P be a fixed index. So uh, a P simplex. in the simplicial set CXAB, so in this mapping space, uh, so this is a P simplex, where A and B are two fixed zero simplices, which are objects of CX, uh, is represented by the following. So first, a necklace, P, something like that. And a map of simplicial sets which takes the initial and terminal vertex of T to A and to B. So I will say a map of bipointed simplicial sets, where x is bipointed by fixed choice of a and b, and third piece of data is uh, a flag, the term they use. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so a flag of subset of vertices of P. So I'm going to use the notation. Right. So again, of length, well, P plus one, such that Uh, the joints of the vertex. Oh, why did I say n here? So should be j. Right. So this is a subset of u zero, and okay. This goes on. Go on here. leave this part. Okay, so subject 
to the following uh, relations. Okay, so if I have like a one piece of such data, uh, and another piece, so let's say necklace S map to X and some choice of these subsets as indicated there. So R identified the, just the joints, yeah. Yeah, the uh, okay, so let me yeah, but but in that one, we choose the sub simplex between i and j, and so the joints become i and j themselves. Uh, no, a so okay, so so we know. For example, this, this will be mapped to A in X, and this will be mapped to B. No, uh, it should also include this. This isn't, yeah, so, um, okay, I, let me finish the statement, then uh, I, I can clarify. Uh, Okay, so there is a relation between these. So in case there is, so we have T to X and S to X. So in case there is here a morphism F, so F is a bipointed map such that this triangle commutes, such that sort of F transports subsets in U to exactly the subsets making up V. Uh, okay, so, and this is the theorem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so as far as I know, I mean, this is the best known result which gives an explicit description of what are the simplices uh, in this simplicial set. So coming back to Ergen's point, so uh, in the example you, so you, okay, so, so if I take x to be just uh, delta n itself, um, Sort of, we defined this, uh, this image, it was just written here what this is, right, for a fixed i and j. So this, I mean, so here we required that sort of i and j are in u0, right? So we had a chain, etc. So this means that the necklace I'm choosing to represent uh, to represent this is actually the, so I can I write this? So, so I have delta n as x and I choose uh, <laughs> delta between i and j. So how can I write this? So, so this is now my t, you see? So I choose this here this is just an inclusion of course okay now the joints become okay so just i and j here because it's like a unique beat okay. so this is how this generalizes so imagine okay so if if these 
were of length 1, these necklaces, the joints would be just the endpoints of this. And they have to be included in everything. Okay, So this is how uh, this statement generalizes our description of thick delta n. Okay, so for each i and j, you pick this subsimplex, and you call this the T, which represents the simplices in the mapping space. Okay. So, and of course, there are some maybe identifications which uh, okay. Any other? So we should have these four big boards here where <laughs> I can keep these things on and sort of point here and there because now I have to erase again and it's going to get messy. Okay, so I should say something else. Um, okay, where should I write now? Yeah, the, so, yeah, okay, so I didn't say this, but uh, so the bun, the, the face and degeneracies are defined by repeating and deleting things in the sequence. So when you do simplicial operations, you don't do anything to T. You just play with this, okay? So, so this is the whole, uh, whole point here. And so, so the way I think about this theorem is that, okay, we choose, we choose the necklace in X, and then, so we know for, for each of these copies of delta n, right, what are the mapping spaces in their thick versions, okay? So it's like you pick a P simplex here and here and here and here, and it's like that sequence. That's the idea. So it's like a chain of P simplices in these thick delta n's in X. No, N no. I mean, if yeah, so so you 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 could get some of them from one copy, but I mean, this is a general simplicial set. So, for example, if the simplicial set is the nerve of a category, okay, any necklace can be sort of completed with a big simplex, right? Because you can compose everything. So if X is the nerve of a category, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if X was the nerve of a category, then you can reduce the theorem down to like just picking a chain of maps. Okay. So this ties with the commonad resolution, which I explained one time, and I don't have time to review. But I mean, that's the thing, um, right? You can use that relation. So, so, so you can pick here, you can include T into the bigger simplex T in case you can do that, right? And then you just uh, actually recover that if you want. Oh, okay. So it, yeah, that's how it generalizes here. Okay, so, so Dagger and Spivak in this paper, so to be 100% honest, I don't like the way they prove this. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> okay, this is not to, I mean, this is a great theorem, which I really like. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I have nothing to say about the theorem. I think 
the proofs are a bit, I don't know. Uh, I mean, when I read, when I, okay, let, let me make this a personal statement. When I read the proofs, I didn't get it, okay? And they define many auxiliary notions, which they use later on for other things. So, but when it comes to this result, okay, so, so what triggered me to actually <laughs> study the details of this stuff is that, okay, so let's, going back, <laughs> I mean, look, we have, we have a co-limit here, okay? So how hard could it be to actually compute it? It's a co-limit of categories. Okay. Then I realized co-limits of categories are kind of difficult, <laughs> so, which I didn't anticipate. Uh, so, so I went on and like uh, uh, sort of, uh, proved something about co-limits of categories which, from which the, this theorem, or let's put it like this, so from which this can be done computationally, this theorem, unlike, I guess, uh, the approach Dagger and Spivak take. So I've already spent <laughs> uh, like 40 minutes just to state the theorem and I haven't stated anything of my work. Okay, uh, so let me sketch for 20 minutes uh, uh, what, uh, what's my contribution in the proof of this. So, uh, okay, so first I have to... Sorry? This coordinates description follows from the fact that you have to define the difference. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, can extensions over pre shift categories are always given with these co limits? My question is this. Here, 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 here. Just. Keep them inside the can extension. I mean. So, yeah, so this is what I contemplated when I actually. One of the things I had in mind when I wrote uh, uh, this note, which is like you, you could have thought about the theorem if you sort of took computing that co-limit very seriously. And, uh, and as far as I could read from their paper, sort of it's not, <laughs> there is a disconnect between I mean, you could see this as an extension of the combinatorial description of the thick delta n. Okay, it makes sense that way. Uh, but how does it tie with that co-limit is a bit of a uh, mystery, at least if you look at things uh, from a very literal point of view. Okay, so let me just quickly... Uh, uh, make another point and then I will very shortly discuss uh, my point of view here. So, uh, so we have, so we have an embedding, okay, let, let me, so we can regard simplicially enriched categories as, and this is actually an embedding, as simplicial objects uh, in categories. This is a known, uh, this is a known thing. Um, okay, so this functor, I want to call it like lower star. So it takes a C, uh, takes a C star. So what's what's the point here? So we can define the category C n. So the objects are same as the objects of C. And the morphisms are n simplices of morphisms of C. So if I have two objects A and B, uh, uh, I will define C and AB to be just the n simplices in this uh, mapping space. Okay? So you sort of pointwise take the simplices in the mapping spaces, it produces these categories Cn. Okay. So 
Uh, so this this embeds simplicial categories into simplicial objects in categories. Okay, and this has an adjoint. Uh, So, uh, so this th this functor is actually left adjoint. Okay. Anyway, the, so the moral is okay. So, so there is this conclusion that I want to use is that um, so if if we have a functor of simplicially enriched categories. Now this is a general functor, a diagram of simplicially enriched categories. When I do uh, oh, let me see here. When I do the colimit and look at the P, P simplices of it, so here p is a fixed number in delta. So this will be the same as doing the collimate point wise. Okay. So, so the moral here, okay, so put in other words, I can compute collimates here by embedding here. But you see, this category is a diagram category in category. Okay, and collimates can be computed pointwise. Okay, so uh, the moral here is that the problem of computing the collimit collimits of simplicially enriched categories reduces to computing collimits of categories. So that it's uh, because we have this isomorphism here. Okay, and so what I went on to, like now I have to erase the actual theorem. Okay, so I'll try to. Yeah, I'll try to be very brief because this gets a little technical. But when you come back with the adjustment. Like the categories. Are you saying that, that was the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you embed the diagram. When you compute the collimit there, it's again going to come back here. Like it's because it's an inclusion, which is an adjunction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In these boundary maps will be identity on objects, and so everything is preserved. Yeah. What the so what, you're meaning the right adjoint here? So it takes the. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to skip this. So, <laughs> so basically, you have a simplicial object in categories. Uh, you take only the part of it. Uh, for, for which the objects are totally degenerate. Degenerate. Yeah, oh, I mean totally degenerate, meaning. Uh, Coming from the Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you look at morphisms between them. That's the uh, discrete line. Okay. Yeah. So the, yeah, the discrete subobject you can say of of a. Uh, of that type of thing. Yeah, so, 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 okay, now what I went on to look at is the, the simplified version of this, which is like just looking at the uh, collimate of uh, categories. So, uh, the notation I want to use, so if I have some i here, I want to call the image ci, and if I have a map in the indexing category i to j, I'm going to call it 
u tilde ci to cj. So just for notational ease. Okay, so so when it comes when it comes to the colimit, okay, so let me so let's call for the moment c the colimit of the diagram. So what we know a priori, okay, so what we know is that the objects of C is just the colimit of the objects in the uh, so so you can sort of think of an object functor from categories to sets, so I'm assuming everything is small. Okay, so when you compose the functor with the objects functor, you get a colimit, you get a diagram of sets. Colimit of that diagram is uh, the objects in the category C. Okay, so, so the, the thing is now that given, so in particular, okay, so objects of C so they are represented by objects uh, in these uh, categories C I subject to uh, some relations given by these functors okay so so then, in thinking about what I noticed is that what is the set C A B? Okay. So if I give you if I give you A and C I, B and C J. What's a morphism in this colimit between the classes these two represent? And I found this to be sort of a, as mysterious as, you know, a question mark that was here about these mapping spaces. Okay. And so I went, so I went on to try to describe these and then deduce the Nicholas theorem. So that's uh, it's possible. Okay, so uh, at this point I can just uh, write the statement because of time. Okay, so so this theorem is going to be a general theorem. It's going to get maybe a little messy. So with notation is here, you know. So uh, a morphism in C A B, I mean not A B but in their classes, is represented by so there are three pieces of data. So there is a choice of representatives. Uh, a and C I being C J, and there is a uh, there is a zigzag uh, uh, let me denote this. So, so I apologize for the mysterious notation I'll just I'll explain in a second a zigzag connecting I and J in J so what I mean is that I have sort of uh, uh, these zigzags and they end with J and the maps pointing on the left 
are L1, L2, etc., and the maps pointing on the right are R1 until Rn. Okay. And a chain of morphisms uh, so I'm just gonna write it like this so a to l1 tilde a1 and then r1 tilde a1 so this would be like the f1 this would be like f2 And the last one will happen in CJ, which will be between, oh, I'm sorry if I'm messing the indices, but between. Mm, I guess this should be A yeah, minus one. Sorry? No, no, it's just, okay, so I'll draw a picture and It's a tilde. So this is A, A. Yeah, that's, these are A's. Yeah. So it's like A0, A1, A2. Okay. Uh, so it's better if I draw a picture at this point because to see how this makes sense. Uh, okay, I'll just erase parts. Um, so, I mean, the theorem continues, but first I want to draw a little picture. So, for example, if I have, uh, uh, so let's say, let's draw, let's write this I1. So, if I have this L and R here, so what I'm saying is that I'm going to look at the category CI, Dj. So here I have A, and here I have D, and here I have Ci1. So the A1 is coming from C. So this will map into some L tilde A1, and I'm going to do F1 here, and this will map into some R tilde A1, and I'm doing F2 here. Okay, so this is like an example of what that looks like. So basically you take these zigzags in the indexing J and then you pick chains like this. And this is how morphisms in colimits of categories are represented. And there is a relation, okay, subject to the relation uh, so uh, because of time I cannot sort of go in full detail here I'm very sorry but I will just say this subject to a relation encoded by a double category by a double category so I I felt like I had to use double category theory to keep track of relations that need to be postulated between uh, those pieces of data okay. uh, so I've denoted this double category like uh, ZF. <laughs> uh, so I define this pretty explicitly in the paper, but it's right. So there is this double category, uh, and the cells in that double category sort of give the correct relations between such pieces of data. Right. So 
yeah i think i don't want to so i apologize if i didn't actually get to so you could see i mean uh at least on the level of data um you can directly make a connection between uh, this set and this set, okay? Because um, uh, you can interpret, okay, maybe I should just write uh, of those are. So, so the, the, the connection between those sets of data are the following. So, if I have a necklace, uh, a necklace can be interpreted as a zigzag. Uh, in the category delta. So what do I mean? I take sort of the first copy of delta, second one and I have delta zeros everywhere okay so this is terminal vertex inclusion initial vertex inclusion for all of them you see if you look at an necklace as a zigzag then you can see that Specifying these chains is the same thing as specifying these chains. That's the basic connection here. So I would say my, what I would regard as a contribution, if that, if I can even claim such thing, with respect to the necklace theorem is that, well, if you look at these necklaces as zigzag, uh, in delta and then if you have a map to x a b this becomes like a zigzag in the simplex category okay so when i look at well i erased it but <laughs> when i look at the colimit uh as postulated by the Oneda extension, I mean, over the simplex category, we could recover sort of uh, the necklace theorem directly from that. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, I apologize. I mean, I didn't get to define what this double category is. And there are a couple of very interesting points which are facilitated by double category theory in making this connection. Uh, and I found that looking at things this way is much more transparent, sort of. You get a very, actually, you could say, you could see how we would think of the necklace theorem in the first place uh, from this perspective. And uh, yeah, that's. That's what I thought when I studied the subject. So <laughs> I hope. So if you want to see more details, you are free to look at the paper. You can ask me any question, of course. I'll be happy to. Okay, thank you, Reddy. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, yeah sure. So what's the relation between this? Oh, okay, so that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should so, uh, repeat the question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 right. Uh, Ready? Do you want to repeat the question? Okay. So, Ergun is asking me, what's the connection between this type of chain and this type of flag? So I just claimed that you can recover them. I didn't. I didn't actually explain. But basically, the point is that. If I have a necklace, so let's just, so let's say you have a necklace, right? 
So when you map this to x, etc. Now making a flag like that will actually include, so let's call these something like, so this would be the a, the b, this would be the a1, right? So you would have, so giving a flag like that is the same thing as from this simplex producing a flag u1 a to a1. So this would be a morphism in uh, thick delta n1 between a and a1. And let's say for a fixed p, like a p simplex. So that's just the length of the chain. And then you would pick here from u2 from a1 to b. Okay, so this would be, say, like in, sorry, in thick delta and 2, uh, a1 to b, let's say p simplex, okay? So every, every flag as postulated in the necklace theorem can be split through the joints, okay? And it will give me morphisms coming from each particular simplex. Okay, which gives me a chain as postulated in the theorem that I wrote down. Okay. So we could see that every triple of data, as in the necklace theorem, actually can be sort of translated in a triple like this. And the tricky part you have to prove, well, it's not tricky, it's actually very intuitive, but every data like this sort of you can reduce down to a necklace and that's that to me was the interesting part mm. so, so maybe that's something related to the last thing you said so the delta zeros up there uh why are they uniform i mean why are they what yeah uniform i mean you're just taking the same object uh, no so so, versus, so like, in the background yeah. in the background there is the fact that this is being mapped to uh, okay, but don't you allow any JIs from the indexing category, not just delta, not just zero? Yeah, ex yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's it's part of the content of the proof of the necklace theorem. So you can take, so if you just literally translate this theorem to the simplex category, right? Mm -hmm. These zigzags can be simplices in X of any dimension. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. So I, I want to just write this down because this to me was the most beautiful part of the proof actually. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm going to be loose with notation, but basically, um, so if you are no, this notation is so. So let's say we pick some representatives. I'm not writing them down explicitly. So from this theorem, I will pick a zigzag and a chain. Okay, so it will be like R L some Fs, whatever, mm -hmm. all that. So now we are in the simplex category. These don't have to be necklaces. These can be general things. So there is always a way to actually replace hmm. double categorically functorially this with a necklace. So I call this necklace replacement. It's pretty easy. I mean, it's not difficult to come up with, actually. It's not anything particular. So so it basically shows that you, you, you go on, you represent a morphism in the colimit. And if you are over the simplex category in the colimits we are interested in, you can functorially replace uh, this data with a necklace. It's very straightforward. Uh, and so the fact, that this, the fact that you can do this functorially just makes the proof of the necklace theorem very easy.
because that's it. Like you pick a representative, you do this replacement. There you go, Necklace theorem. This is actually the main idea in the proof I presented. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions on Zoom? Uh, okay. I don't see any questions on Zoom. <laughs> Let me check again. Okay. All right. So let's thank uh, Reddy for the nice talk.